Well, let's, let's dive into this today because I think the text that we have um, is pretty thick. Um, it's kind of like a milkshake, kind of thick. You got to take your time getting through it, but I think it is super, super tasty for today. But I will ask, since we haven't, um, since we haven't had an opportunity to gather in two weeks, and first of all, let me say thank you for your understanding around last week. Last week went wonderful for our family, and thank you for just letting me be able to zero in on my kids for a little while. Um, how y'all doing? Tell me something good before we before we fly into our lesson for today. Two weeks, something good has happened. <laughs> well, the Democrats now have a full a full candidate now. So, are you saying that uh, now we can go full on into the election cycle? That that's good news. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> that's one part you don't have to guess anymore. That's that's fair. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yep, we are full on into election season. May yeah. God have mercy on our Oh, Anything else good? I have an appointment tomorrow again at 2 o'clock to visit mom. It'll be the second one. Excellent. Good for you. Good for we you. celebrated my husband's birthday this weekend. That was That's fun. right. Yay! Yeah. Two things I didn't know about him. Number one, I didn't know he was left-handed. Number two, didn't know he played golf. So we might have to, we might have to do that. <laughs> As a left-handed golfer, um, I appreciate playing golf with people who stand on the proper side of the ball. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Our son is left-handed, but he, he uh, golfs and bowls right-handed. So. See, that's, that's the kind of thing that lands you in purgatory for a couple of years until Jesus – switch yeah. you out <laughs> that's how caleb is he throws right-handed and hits left-handed i've never been able to figure out folks who can do that well i when i played ball i i was a switch hitter ah but i threw did everything right-handed uh, yeah. otherwise throwing dot you'll appreciate this the only thing i do right-handed is cut with scissors because I got that- sick and tired as a kid of waiting for the one pair of left-handed scissors. Yes. So I'm like, I'm just going to teach pair. myself how to do this. You're right. There were always only one or two pairs. Only of one. <laughs> and I was never the most assertive kid in class, you know, so there was always some bigger left-hander than me throwing elbows to try to get those scissors first. So you learned to do that right-handed. I yes. learned how to do it right-handed. It's the only thing I do right-handed. <laughs> well, at least now, Sam, mostly all scissors are either. Well, that's fair. Yeah. That's better. And I learned if you just get a nice sharp pair, it'll cut at the end of the day. Unlike the ones they gave us in elementary school. No offense, Dot. <laughs> yeah. They were pretty bad. They weren't supposed to cut. They were pretty bad. <laughs> Safety. Oh. No. So, well, our, uh, our, our reading for today, um, I will tell you, is the one reading that I really, it was one reading that was very unexpected for me as I was preparing for this. There were... I had, there were a bunch that I kind of knew we, we were going to do. Like, I knew we were going to do some poetry, Mad Farmer, Liberation Front, Wild Geese. I was like, oh, yeah, we're definitely doing that. Um, agrarianism and industrialism, agrarian standard, I knew we were going to do that. This is the one that surprised me as I was reviewing things. Um, and so part of me is still coming to this and trying to, trying to make sense of it myself. Um, but I think there is so much that is positive here. Um, But I think there's also some room for criticism, too, and I'm excited to do all of it. And so um, we are going to be reading, or we have read for today, People, Land, and Community. And so the theme that I want to set out with for today is this idea, and if you read my email, um, you know this is kind of what I want to talk about for today, is this idea of anthropology. You'll forgive me for throwing around a big word, um, but I really do want to think about how we understand ourselves. So... Anthropology has a couple different meanings inside of a couple different um, streams of thought. Um, Generally, when we think of anthropology, we think of, you know, the study of human societies and cultures. And so it comes to us from the from the Latin word and anthro or anthros, simply meaning man or human. Um, And so we usually think about it in terms of studying, you know, society and culture and all those kind of things. we might also recognize biological anthropology, which is really more the study of how um, human beings as a species have developed and evolved over time. Um, and of, of course that intersects with social anthropology, um, but we can, we can do anthropology through biology as well. But if we can do all that, then we can also do this thing that we call theological anthropology. And mm-hmm. theological anthropology still in the same way as the study of humanity 
but it asks more deep, it asks deeper and more spiritual questions about us. So who are we? How are we created? What is our current condition now? And what is God doing about that condition? So it asks, it asks really deep questions about what it means to be a human being in a spiritual sense. And so it really, and it really is intended to answer this basic question, what is the human condition? Who are we? What, what, what does it mean to be a human? But what's interesting is as we read the scriptures through an anthropological lens, which means just seeing what the Bible has to say about us as humans, um, we do not get a single thought of anthropology at all. We actually get very different understandings of very different an- anthropologies. Um, so I'll offer you a few, and then maybe if you want to, if there are some that spring to mind, I'd love for you to throw them into the pot and we can kind of mix it up a little bit. But one of the most basic uh, anthropological statements the Bible gives us comes out of Genesis, where it tells us that we are formed in the image of God. And so we say something really profound about that, and we've been, as people of faith, we've been trying to flesh out what does it mean to be made in the image of God. But we assume it is something positive, is a positive anthropological statement. But also, um, we get very negative anthropological statements. Um, The prophet Jeremiah writes, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can know it? So Jeremiah is very much down on humanity as a whole. um, And and there's a a lot of negativity coming out of of Jeremiah. Roman shares a little bit of Jeremiah's um, perspective when we read that very famous verse, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so we're saying something about humanity when we say every, literally everyone has sinned, everyone falls short of God's glory. What does that mean? We're asking anthropological questions. But then there are other more positive ones. For instance, we go, we go back to the prophets in Isaiah. Isaiah. In Isaiah, God says to people, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. And so there's this sense that God wraps God's arms around us. So even though we might be deceitful above all things, desperately wicked, desperately sick, God still loves us. That's an anthropological statement. And then finally, Jesus makes many statements, one of which he says um, to Peter, he says, I will make you fishers of people. So there's an anthropological purpose to tend to our neighbors. So we get these, again, we get these very different understandings of who we are as people, and the Bible is very diverse in these kind of things. Um, Any other examples, any other sort of anthropological statements that might spring to mind for you, things that, things that maybe you've heard or thought you've had about what it means to be a human from a, from a faith perspective? This is tricky, I know. Okay. I encourage you to keep thinking about it. Um, and if anything pops up, please throw it into the middle of the conversation. Um, but the point of bringing up the Bible's anthropology is to say that it is, it, is a good, it is a good practice of people of faith to always be asking ourselves about our assumptions about who we are as human beings. And as we, as we take anthropology and go into our conversation for today— um, There are various anthropological um, positions we might take as humans relate to creation. And so three that are very basic, and I'm going to state them to you, and then I'm going to ask you to think about, well, what would that mean for how we relate to creation or to the environment or to the ecosystems that are around us? So there are a couple different ways we might understand. Some people will say right now that humans are nothing more than a creature, that we are no better or worse than everything else that it is around us. So we are just another pile of carbon and DNA, and we intersect with everything around us. So what, what ramifications might that have if we take that anthropological point, point of view, that we're just a creature, nothing more? It doesn't allow for... Um, intellect. It doesn't allow for free will. Hmm. It doesn't. Um, it, do, it it's 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 too diminishing. It's too narrow. Hmm. Yeah, uh, it I would have ramifications it, that way. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. Go ahead. I don't think it. I mean, addresses the idea that we also have souls. We're more than just physical beings. 
Mm -hmm. you know, and that there's something after this. Yeah. Whereas most created beings, they just, you know, return back to the earth. And mm -hmm. Any other reflections on that? I think both of those are very good. You can see how those, those ramifications would come from assuming that we're nothing more than creatures. On the other hand, if we're nothing more than creatures, that is to then that you, you could say that then well that doesn't there's no there's no difference between us and other creatures. Yeah. And that actually there would be there could be more solidarity between <clears throat> us and other creatures if we actually saw ourselves as creatures. Awesome. Good. Yeah, and so you can see anthropological statement has ramifications. So how we understand ourselves leads further down. Another anthropological statement we often make, um, other people will take, is that human beings are over and above creation. So all of creation is here. Human beings are actually on a different level. What kind of ramifications might that have if we were to adopt that position? Well, that develops a little bit of responsibility that goes along with it. When we were created by God, man was created to watch over things. Mm -hmm. So I think our brain is supposed to be a, a higher level thinking. brain. Yeah. And then we have a thinking process. Can Well, you would question that sometimes about reasoning, but we're supposed <laughs> to be able to reason. But, there it uh, is. So. Okay, good. Well, I think, I, I think a lot of what we're thinking has to do with, uh, how shall I put it, uh, evolvement in this, but not necessarily in the sense that uh, there are people we would call humans uh, in the deep recesses of the Amazon or whatever that are living no different now than they had thousands of years ago. Mm -hmm. And unless we want to just discount them and say that, uh, you know, they're not to be included. Uh, that's something to consider from an anthropological sense also. Yeah. I have seen just thinking about if humans are over and above creation and not connected to creation, it does, it has created, I think a really destructive mindset. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so for instance, you know, my, I, my, my dad's side of the family is from West Virginia, um, mountaintop removal, um, you know, comes from an anthropological position that says the world is ours to play with as we want to do whatever we want because we are over and above it. And so if we want to remove the tops so that we can have the energy that is found within, we are free to do so. Um, so I feel like, you know, there are times that, that humans over and above creation, that anthropological understanding can, can create destruction. Um, sure. I, yeah, I think the, so the in that same um, kind of that same vein and also like sort of what he's uh, what uh, Wendell says about learning and like what we um, I think we have this idea sometimes as humans that like education like formal <laughs> education is some sort of like panacea like that, <laughs> that's that's the end all be all and there's so many different ways of, of learning so many different ways of of contributing, being smart, things like that, that, that we need the, there's, you know, we, we kind of elevate maybe even just thinking and thought in that context or the way we think in, as humans um, and forget how important it is, like the other parts of just even thinking about the ecosystem um, and everything that contributes to that. Mm -hmm. um, so I like where you're going with that because it kind of gets to that. I think he really makes a really a great point about what we ascribe to with, in terms of information and how much you know and things like that. Any other thoughts on? Yeah, one, one other thought and, and uh, this over and above creation notion, to me, it's a, um, an all powerful kind of outlook and it um, invites competition, good competition, mm -hmm. bad competition. Uh, yet the strong in that competition would impose their will on others. Hmm. I hadn't even gotten there yet. That's good. 
<laughs> and so, and so these, these kinds of thoughts, I think, are really useful because they demonstrate thinking about ourselves as human beings has a real importance for how we think about our life and how we engage with the community and the ecosystem and everything around us. And I think part of the reason I wanted to bring this essay to the fore is that as people of faith who find ourselves in a variety of faith communities um, or even just practicing a faith in and of ourselves, these kinds of questions are important questions to ask, but they're not questions that we're used to asking. We're used to assuming a certain kind of anthropology and then trying to build some sort of faith around it when sometimes how we understand ourselves is precisely the question that we need to ask. And I think Barry's essay um, today speaks more to his anthropology than just about anything else that we've read thus far. And so to give you a little background on this, um, again, the title is People, Land, and Community, and it was originally delivered as a lecture. So it's worth knowing that he had written this to be spoken more so than to be read. Um, it was delivered in 1981 at the first annual Oh, excuse me, at the first annual E.F. Schumacher Lectures, which at that time were hosted at Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts. Um, E.F. Schumacher, for those of you who are interested in these themes, is worth looking up and worth reading a little bit about. Has anybody read anything by Schumacher? Just curious. Um, for those of you who are local, I have one of his books on my shelf. Um, you're welcome to it if you want to dive into it. Um, the book is entitled Small is Beautiful, Economics as if People Mattered. And, Schumacher, and this is useful because Barry, as he's giving this lecture, he says, um, I went back and read a lot of Schumacher because this lecture series is intended to honor him. So I wanted to make sure I understood a little bit about him. <clears throat> Schumacher has his own anthropology that I think is way, way, way in the background of what Barry shares with us today. <clears throat> Schumacher says, modern man does not experience himself as a part of nature, but as an outside force destined to dominate and conquer it. Shoemaker's words again, modern man does not experience himself as a part of nature, but as an outside force destined to dominate and conquer it. Mm -hmm. We can argue about Shoemaker whether he's right or not, but I think he has something, I think he is a partner to the way Barry outlines his own anthropology in the essay that we have before us. Um, Good news is that as I was looking and doing a little research on this, I found the recording of Barry giving this lecture. Um, and so I will post that later if you wanted to go back and listen to it. What's interesting is how much the audience laughs during this, <laughs> during this lecture. And so I would encourage you, if, this, if it felt weighty, it was not delivered that way. It had a certain lightness and levity to it. Um, particularly around the parts around marriage, which any of us who have been married might understand um, would put a smile on some people's faces. <laughs> um, but this essay lends itself to thinking about ourselves, beginning with the connections that join people, land, and community. Um, he talks about the best human use of a, hill, of a problematical hillside farm. And so he's going to challenge our assumptions about ourselves, ask if those assumptions are true, and if not, then perhaps propose other assumptions that are closer to being true. And there's the cat making its appearance today. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so he begins with this. Um, he begins with this one assumption, um, and. And like I said, I'm still processing this, so if you have questions or insights, please jump in with them. But he begins with this assumption, let me see, um, on page 183, so to speak, uh, the first full paragraph, he makes an interesting anthropological statement, and then that leads into another one. He says, always the assumption is that we can first set demons at large, and then somehow become smart enough to control them. This is not childishness. It is not even human weakness. It is a kind of idiocy. But perhaps we will not cope with it and save ourselves until we regain the sense to call it evil. And so I wonder if there are any places in our wider world where you see us creating a demon in order to solve a problem and then assuming that we'll be able to fix the problem later that we can create a demon and then we can solve we can solve the problem that that demon brings into the world. 
I mean, I immediately think of climate change. Hmm. Say more about that. How do you, what demon did we un unleash on the world and how do we propose to fix it after we've unleashed it? Well, uh, releasing uh, all these different uh, chemicals and carbon-based fuels into the atmosphere and uh, some claim it's a, uh, there's no such thing. I believe there, there is an effect. All you gotta do is look at the uh, effect uh, at the polar ice caps. Uh, I think the big question though is, well, I don't want to get into that, but. Uh, um, You're good here. She, and she, if it goes too far, I'll, I'll pull us should, out, go ahead. Should, should, this, should this country be the, be the country of conscious, conscience, I'm sorry, uh, that expends all this money to try to do something about it and, and become the heroic figure if none of the other countries of the world follow suit and it just postpones, you know, things by a short period of time. The other thing that comes to mind is, uh, is water availability. Uh, if you think of what's going on in California, where uh, all this growing is taking place and they're drilling lower and lower and lower and lower, the water table is just going down and down and down. And the attitude is, uh, you know, well, we're not going to have a problem for the next, I think he goes into this, yeah, for the, the next Ogallala five, aquifer, six, seven yeah. years. So. Who cares what happens after that? Uh, I mean, I guess I could take that attitude because I'm 77, but if I was 37 years old, I might feel a little different about it. it it's like there's an emphasis on the here and now rather than the future. Mm -hmm. As a uh, as a representative of the 37 year old demographic, I will tell you, yes, I have concerns <laughs> around that. <laughs> But yeah, he, he does mention that. He talks about the Ogallala Aquifer and, you know, oh, yeah, it's got enough water for 50, 60 years. And he's like, seriously? <laughs> like, that sounds okay to you? <laughs> Other ways that we have unleashed demons that we're having a hard time putting the toothpaste back in the tube. I mean, the one that's been on my mind lately is, is nuclear power and nuclear weaponry mm -hmm. since we just passed the anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yeah. Um, and that, I think that unleashed all kinds of demons that we didn't, we didn't know what to do with and we still don't know what to do with them. Yeah. And I have, been, I have been obsessed with Chernobyl for a long, long time. And so that, you know, this idea, not just in terms of warfare, but in terms of power, the tremendous amount of destruction that, I mean, that, yeah. that was unleashed on this countryside. And I think it right now is 1.1% safe, like all these years after Chernobyl and we're 1% towards that, be, that place being inhabitable again in any meaningful way. Well, and, and perhaps like even more recently, like looking at what, I mean, what happened in Beirut, right? Like. Yeah. We're going to stick all this stuff in a warehouse and we'll get to it. And then, you know, some like that's the, a great example of like how it comes due when you don't take care of things yeah. in a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, One other that I'll add on, um, because I think, I think it's something agriculture uniquely unleashed on the world. Let's be honest about chattel slavery in the United States. Um, chattel slavery happened because we needed workers. And so we, you know, so we create, so we go over, we find these workers, we buy and sell those workers. And in doing so, unleash these, this stratified notion of race onto our country that we're still trying to figure out. Um, and still trying to trying to put things back in place because, by the way, of a really poor anthropology that there were some people who are excellent and wonderful and God ordained and other people who were three fifths of a person, really bad anthropology. And so I feel like race um, 
is another one of those things where we assumed a certain kind of knowledge would bail us out of a problem, and in doing so, unleash another problem on us entirely. Uh, one other example maybe would be uh, technology. Um, We're waiting for that, yeah. <laughs> We're waiting yeah. for the, the Chernobyl to happen with that, aren't we? <laughs> Well, I, I'm thinking more of the electronic digital kind and the, um, and, and the impact that it's having on the quality of our lives. Yeah. You know, I'm older, I grew up, there wasn't even a black and white television in the first few years of my life. And everything now is based on immediate gratification. Everything mm -hmm. has to be faster, easier, less labor intensive. Uh, we don't even have to think. You've got your whole library right there on your phone. Um, it's, it's just so instantaneous and it's just making us lazier. Mm. Nice. Point well taken. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I, I don't know as I agree with that 100% as far as being lazier. Uh, I think giving us access to knowledge and information quickly rather than, uh, you know, uh, going to the library or something is not necessarily the worst thing in the world. Uh, I can agree with that, when, Michael. I'm also thinking about the vast, vast libraries of forms of entertainment, whether it's uh, video games, whether it's um, uh, movies, it's, you know, they're just, it's, 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 it's a, an overwhelming amount of entertainment. Yeah, I agree with you there. And, you know, I, I, I still have this uh, very, very strong opinion about uh, video games and children and the violence in the video games and the time, the average time a child spends uh, on the computer or playing games rather than uh, reading or keeping up with schoolwork. You're right. And so Barry, after he's talking about this, he then goes on to make this very striking, almost harsh anthropological statement. It says, the trouble, as in our conscience moments we all know, is that we are terrifyingly ignorant. <laughs> and so I wanted to invite you, okay, to just reflect on that. And then as, as Abby pointed out earlier, I mean, he goes on to talk about the way that we, the way that we think about knowledge um, and how knowledge, and, and, he, and I, I won't spend a lot of time, I know you read it, but I mean, so he says we are terrifyingly ignorant. I wonder how that, does that ring true for you? Or does that feel like an unnecessarily low anthropology? Um, I know that for me, you know, they have that saying that's like when you leave high school, you think you know everything. Then when mm -hmm. you get your bachelor's degree, you know, uh, you realize maybe you don't know some things. And then your master's, you realize you know nothing, you know. <laughs> and so, um, that's definitely rung true for me as I've gone through education and just learned that, you know, the more I delve into one subject, the more I realize there's so much more yeah. out there I don't know. Mm -hmm. We are terrifyingly ignorant. How does that sit with you? I think it's true. And in addition to acknowledging that for myself, um, it, it makes me feel like, um, you know, what we concentrate on learning, you know, I mean, if you want to become certified, be eligible to do such and such, you know, it, it, it has its benefits, but, um, you know, why do we concentrate on learning what we learn? How, how important is what we learn? Hmm. Um, and, and, and who's making decisions on what we should learn? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Yeah. Who, who gets to say what is important knowledge? You know, what is knowledge we must have and who says what knowledge is superfluous? One thing that occurred to me is that uh, somebody who 
thinks they're smart or is told that they're smart, uh, that, that, that is the breeding ground for arrogance. Hmm. There's, I don't know, there's something to be said for humility, I think. I think you're very much in agreement with Barry at that point as this yeah. essay develops. We see that, we actually see that word show up multiple mm -hmm. times. Um, he goes on from this terrifyingly ignorant thing and then he talks about the fact that like, can we ever have enough information to make a decision? Can we ever be fully educated enough? You know, and I love how he talks about this idea of an informed decision. He seems to think that is a, that is a farce. There is no such thing as a fully informed decision. Um, he says, the informed decision I suggest is as fantastical a creature as the, quote, disinterested third party and the, quote, objective observer. By the way, in the lecture, this also um, netted a great deal of laughter. So this was sort of, so everybody seemed to understand that there is no sense of this disinterested third party. I can tell you in church, there is no disinterested third party, let me <laughs> assure you. Um, and then he uses this metaphor of marriage. And he talks about how we can never know enough as we enter into these relationships. We can never actually make a, an informed decision. And I wonder as you were reading through, and whether you're married or not, um, certainly you understand relationships that are based on affection, whether that is a deep friendship, it could be a marriage, um, it, could be, it could be some other form of a relationship. So we don't have to take marriage strictly in the male-female sense that I think he in the, in the metaphors he uses, um, he has here. But I wonder, does that, did that, did that idea of marriage as a decision we can't make with all the information, well, did that ring true for you or did that feel unnecessarily negative about marriage? I'm just curious how you read that section. Well, I certainly have been listening to all of you speak <clears throat> and Sam knows how I feel about myself. I'm not uneducated. I'm just, over the years, I've just learned to express myself in a totally different way, which I don't think is right or wrong, but some of the conversations and opinions and thoughts that you've shared have just kind of like really made me sit here quietly and think about it. But when I read the part of how can this man, you know, Barry, that is so educated, lived in the city, he's, he's living in the, what, hills of Kentucky, Sam, am I right? Yep. Yeah. Right. Okay, but how can you compare agriculture to marriage? I sat for almost 45 minutes last night, and all I could come up with, and I mean, I wrote a note down here. I was married one time, and yes, it ended up in divorce, but I wrote down, how can you compare agriculture and marriage? I mean, for me, it was, you marry, and this is just me. I say you, but it's just me. Married for personal feelings faith in one another, building one new life from two people, wishing, hoping, and setting goals for the future, and then one mistake can crush it all, unfaithfulness. I, I really have trouble comparing that to um, what Barry's trying to say, and I'm going to let you all run with it because that's where I had to just put like a, a comma after it because <laughs> I really, this was a lot of heavy reading for me. I think I've read it six times last night. Yeah, it is heavy. Yeah, it was. Well, then let's help, let's help Michelle here a little bit. So how, how, how does he use marriage to make sense of ag? And then later he says that all, everything he says about ag is intended to inform us about marriage as well. So how does he do that? Well, you in marriage, uh, uh, like uh, preparing a field to grow a crop, you need to cultivate. It, a lot of times, it just doesn't happen automatically. You need you need to have the responsibility to cultivate and keep the weeds out of it and that kind of thing. Whereas in a marriage, you're constantly cultivating your relationship with your spouse, trying to make it better and and go forward so i look i look at it a little bit that way with uh how you compare it with uh with your marriage mm -hmm. 
and working towards a future that you can't see up front. Right. Um, I think that, you know, I, I mean, I love your list, Michelle, like all it's, it's so much like agriculture in my mind. Um, and I think Barry talks about sort of choosing land to buy and commit to is kind of like choosing a partner. You, you see all the good things about it. You see all this potential. You don't really know what's going to happen. You, but you, like, like I said, you, you cultivate it. You try to work at it um, because you have, you have that faith in what its future might be, even if you can't see it all up front. I also look at this idea of control. I think a lot of people, when they get land, they want to control it. You know, they want to figure out how to do what they want with it and to bring something for themselves out of it. But as Mother Nature will show you, you, you cannot control the land. And it's the same way with like a person, you know, you, you cannot control this other person. You have to learn to grow alongside them um, and work towards goals together. And so I think that's kind of something that I saw as well. Okay. No, I think it's great. Um, and Michelle, thank you. Just being like, hey, I don't see this. Like, it's okay to, like, to be like, I don't, I don't quite understand the analogy. But I think what he's doing is putting these two things together and saying that, again, he's looking anthropologically at this. So he's saying, as we enter into marriage, we can never know all the information. We can never have all the information we're going to need to know whether this is a good idea, not a good idea, to understand how it's all going to play out. Um, I think he says, and I love this line, it was another line that got laughter. He says, the only people who have all the information they need to make a decision about marriage are widows and widowers, and they don't have enough information to remarry, okay? Like, even a <laughs> lifetime of marriage doesn't teach us everything we need to know about marriage, um, you know, and, and we can see that, I mean, I don't mean to call anybody out, but Stephen Dot, I think you represent the folks who have been married the longest. I imagine you're still learning a lot about this and to imagine doing it all over again would be, you know, you're like, why would you even want to step into that? You know, so. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have time to train another one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> uh, oh, just, a good one, but there, there's a lot, a lot of truth to that, you know. If, um, you talk <laughs> about as you get older and you uh, people, uh, one of them passes on, you think about companionship. Um, you do different things de depending on situations and, uh, and time, you know, mm -hmm. when you first get married in our case, you know, there were a lot of things that were unknown, but we thought we knew each other and we, we continue to find out things about each other that, uh, you know, are just part of the, part of the makeup. And, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, you got to resolve them. Yeah. And so he's using these things to talk about knowledge as an insufficient way to make decisions about our life, that, that information is not sufficient to think about our relationships. It's not sufficient. Um, he's also going to say in terms of a farm. So he's asking and saying, well, what is a better way to build a life? And then he goes on to talk about love. And he says, these two things are very, are, are, he says, these are not the same thing, but the way a marriage, we enter into a marriage for love and then discover other realities is the same way we might enter into a farm with love, but then discover that there are other realities present. Um, the idea that we can, that we can know our way to something um, is absurd. And so he's saying, let's trust less our ability to, so to figure out the world. And again, this is, this, is a, this is an anthropological statement. Maybe we should be a little less trusting of our idea that we, can, that we can narrow everything down to nickels and dimes and to know exactly, to have all the data to make decisions. I mean, we see this in marriage now. How many apps are out there that claim that they can, they can make us, they can form us into a number that will perfectly unite us with somebody else. Like we continue to do this. And this goes back to this industrial idea, the idea information linked to machines that we can, if we have enough information, we can make a machine that will make the world perfect. That'll make the world just as we have it, as, as we want it. But then he goes on and says, in farming, we often fall in love with a piece of land until we actually start working that. Um, 
I remember when we bought our first house, which I'm about to sell, and I'm looking forward to being done with it, to be honest with you. Um, but I remember, you know, they told me, they're like, there's some, there are some water issues around here. And I was like, well, that'll be all right. You know, I want to put the goats out there. And they're like, well, there's some water that flows down. If it rains really hard, it's going to be out there. I'm like, no, 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 it'll be fine. We'll figure it out. I, I just want goats. I'm just so excited to have a couple goats at my house. And I'm really looking forward to this. Well, when you know where the water wanted to run down that hill was right through the middle of the pasture, right through where the goats wanted to be. And all of a sudden I've got hoof issues because the goats are standing in water and goat's hooves do not, are not built for water. Um, they're built oh, for rocks. Wow. And so I ended up with all these hoof issues. This, the idea of having my own piece of property, which I love the idea of, showed that it didn't matter what I wanted it to do. The land was going to do what it was going to do. And the wisdom was there. I didn't listen to the wisdom because I thought I knew better. Um, <laughs> but it's that same kind of idea. And so what he's saying is that as we think about ourselves, trusting less that we can have it sorted out that we can figure out everything before we move forward is this anthropological statement that informs how we approach not just farming, but the entirety of our life. Um, and so to continue on, um, and I want to make sure that we get through most of this. Um, there's a lot of statements in here that I would like to unpack. But let's see, where is, forgive me for a second. And so what he says is that as we, page 185, as we live into love and we do learn through the process of experience, uh, first paragraph, first full paragraph, says, but our decisions can also be informed, our loves both limited and strengthened by those patterns of value and restraint, principle and expectation, memory, familiarity, and understanding that inwardly adds up to character and outwardly to culture. And so, and so he's saying that as we live into love, love is a basis for things instead of knowledge, um, we start to realize that there are limits on things. And this is another anthropological statement that he makes, that human beings are fundamentally limited. And we are at our best when we are limited. We are healthier when we understand appropriate limits and live, with, live within those limits. And so... Let's see, is that what I wanted to read? It is. I'm trying to catch up. I'm sorry. Here we go. So top of 186. The real, the human knowledge is understood as implying and imposing limits, much as marriage does. And these limits are understood to belong necessarily to the definition of a human being. And so what... So I wonder, this idea of limits, he's going to talk about that in marriage, that we enter into marriage, it imposes some sorts of limits on us, and maybe you all can talk about some of the limits that you have experienced in relationships. Um, farming also, land can only produce so much, there are limits to land, and so I wonder how you, th is, it, is it possible that limits for humanity are a good thing? We are better thinking about ourselves as limited people rather than humans with unlimited potential. I told you, I'm struggling with questions. I know that. But I'm trying to make sense of what he's saying here. I mean, that makes me think of the verse in the Bible that says, you know, um, my power is perfected in your weakness. You know, mm. we're only able to do things when we acknowledge that we have limits. But if we're trying to be these people who have no limits, then what use is there for God? Hmm. No, I think that's, that's a really interesting biblical anthropology that like we're actually there's actually some sense of as we are limited god is the one who is unlimited and that shapes how we think about how we interact with our how we understand ourselves and interact with one another i think that's really powerful other reflections on that or the idea of limits I don't know, for me, like when I think about limits in terms of what I, what, and, and in terms of how we, he, in, not just in this essay, but in other essays about how we work with land, it seems like what's needed is more humility around um, our, 
our place as humans, whether that's with God or with land or, you know, just this, like, so I don't know whether I would call it the limit, but like more of this, like understanding of the limitation of our knowledge, the limitation of our ability to, to care for things more in the future. Um, and, and that kind of as an aspect of like the character and the culture that he's trying to point us towards, hmm. he being Wendell Berry, but probably also God as well. Um, so for me, that's what I get about it. Like this, this need to be humble as a human being for all of it. Mm -hmm. So if we are, and we understand this, I mean, whether we wrap our arms around it or not, we have this understanding that even in our physical selves, we are limited. We can only grow so much. We can only do so much. We're limited by 24 hour days. Um, we're limited by the fact that all of us are going to die at some point. So we are, we have a beginning and we have an end um, in terms of our presence here on, if, on this earth. We can talk about souls and eternity later as, an, as another interesting uh, study in anthropology. Um, but if we are limited, we, he is still encouraging us to think longer about how we, how, about how we create health and how we can be, how humans can be healthy and allow goodness to go beyond sort of the limits of us. And this is where he starts talking about culture. And he says that as we understand our limits and live on a, on a particular place and interact with that particular place and with particular people, he says it, it grows up into, says it grows up into character within ourselves. And then that character as it is shared spills back out then into a culture. And he says culture is something that has to be passed down. That he says, because we're limited, the only way for humans to live into health, the only way we can expand beyond our limits is actually by understanding that we are a part of a community. And so I think this is where this communal understanding of anthropology rubs up against very modern understandings of anthropology, where we have been taught regularly all the time, we are individuals, we make our own decisions, we are in charge of our life, and we have freedom that is over and against other people, like other people can do their thing, but ultimately we understand us, ourselves as an individual. I think Barry is calling us to think of ourselves as an individual, but always and everywhere located within a larger community. And I wonder if there are places where you have heard, um, where you have heard this kind of idea of, and is, w would you say that it's true that our, our culture, the modern American culture teaches us that we are individualistic, not beholden to anybody else or any other, or, or anything. Is that a fair statement? Probably. 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 I, I have to be honest, as I was reading this, and I got lost sometimes in what Barry was, trying to get across, I guess. I, That's okay. I kept thinking, I kept thinking about generation to generation to generation. And I know how many times I look back and think, yeah, what's the generation going to look like for our grandchildren? Well, let's look how it's different from when our, you know, from our grandparents or, and then I, right away, I get the image of the Amish. They have sort of just stayed and especially since there's a buggy that drives right by our house every <laughs> now and then uh, recently, because I think we have several in the Amish families in the area. Some have moved into yeah. the area, yes. So I, I guess I got caught in another, going another direction and then, you know, thinking about the technology. I mean, you just look at the phone here. The phones are so different than what our grandparents had. Um, and the system of communication and everything that, that we call progress is Barry saying this really isn't, progress isn't good. Yes, we've made a lot of mistakes with the progress we've made and that's where we need to, to correct things, whether it be our environment or the problems with technology. But I guess I, I got lost then when hearing him saying it should be, you know, like handing down, just like handing down a farm from generation to generation to generation. Mm. Um, and Steve and I were think, talking about, you know, how many farms are around that are third or fourth generation. There are some, but a lot of people had to give that up. 
because they couldn't afford it. Um, anyway, that's that's not really I think it's answering good. your question. It's just making me think, bear, I guess, and maybe it would have helped if you, I would have heard him in a lecture doing this, because some of the stuff you had said at the beginning, like some of the things he said, um, maybe the way he said it, I don't know, I just got the opinion that, does he feel like all this progress is from Renew and we need to be all Amish people? I don't know. <laughs> well, let's, let's ask think. that question as we try to land this plane a little bit. Um, <laughs> and so would, would Barry say that all progress is good progress? No, he wouldn't say that. And how would he nuance it? Like, what would he say? How do we know good progress? I think he would say that good progress has to result in an increase in that character and community and culture that you're talking about. I think he, I think he would say that if you can use a tractor and a computer in a way that actually really genuinely connects you to people and connects you to your land, I, I think he might say that that's, that's acceptable progress. I think he would have a hard time thinking that that's very likely to do with certain pieces of technology. Um, he, there's another essay of his that is, is a fun read, um, which I think is called like, why I am not going to buy a computer yes. or something like that. Yeah, he doesn't um, have a computer, I don't think. Yeah, he writes everything by hand and he sort of explains why he makes that decision. And mm -hmm. a lot of it has to do with the fact that he has this very interactive writing process with his wife and, and he wants to write things out by hand and talk about them with his wife. And he thinks a computer will interrupt that relationship. Um, but I, I think that I, I don't think he's trying to say that everyone should be Amish and go backwards. I think he just wants everything to be in its place and that we should take our time and think about what values are we proliferating with whatever technology we choose to use. Some of them I think are more dangerous than others or he would think are more dangerous than others. But I don't think he wants to sort of categorically make any judgments like that. Actually, you you bring up the tractor uh, on page one ninety one. He actually implies that uh, uh, it goes without saying that tools can be introduced into this agricultural and ecological order without jeopardizing it, but only up to a certain kind, scale, and power. To introduce mm -hmm. a tractor into it, as the historical record now seems virtually to prove is to begin its destruction. But I have problems with statements yeah. like that. I mean, uh, uh, if you had a field, Sam, that you wanted to plow, would you uh, buy an ox and a, whatever you call those things to make the furrows? Or would that no. be technological pro uh, progress? Would you just do it all by hand? I mean, uh, I don't know. I just had a problem with that particular statement. He mm. being just anti-machine. Yeah, my dad used a two-bottom plow all the time with our tractor. The new ones do seven or beyond that. Or sometimes they don't even plow. <coughs> they do no-till and that kind of thing. So anyway, it, 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 all things are relative, I think. So, and I, I mean, Mike, I hear what you're saying, and I, the way that I read Barry is very much, the, I, I'm very much in agreement with Kevin, that he's not anti-machine. What he's saying is that the machine, I think, what I think he's saying, the machine gives the illusion of being able to go beyond limits. That there's only so much you can hand plow in a day. I don't care how good you are. You can't, you can't do, um, you know, a thousand acres. It, you know, you can't do a thousand acres by hand. And what he's yeah. saying is that by introducing the tractor in order, because you need to plow a thousand acres, let's just imagine we're, we're a Midwestern corn farmer for now. By introducing a tractor, you have then put something between you and the land. Now, all of a sudden, you're not as connected to that land. You have exceeded the bounds and limits that you originally had. All right. And for what purpose? 
is up, it remains up for grabs. So, I mean, was it for the purpose of having more money? Was it, you know, for the, why did we need to expand those? Why did we need to go beyond those limits? And I think that's what he's asking us, asking us to look at is we are limited. We cannot know it all. And by introducing technology, at times we have gone beyond our limits to our detriment. And so he's saying, maybe there is a healthier, more limited way of thinking about life where actually there is a balance of scale. Doesn't mean we can't use a tractor, but just be aware that the tractor always brings with it this temptation to do more. And we always have to be asking ourselves, what's the motivation for doing more? Is it because ultimately we, have a, we, wanna, we wanna go beyond what our anthropology might tell us? Is that, yes, we are limited, we cannot know everything, and we cannot control everything. I, uh, well, I agree with you. The, 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 uh, primarily, it's probably all about uh, uh, growing more crops, doing more mm -hmm. cultivating, making more money. Uh, money is a great, uh, you know, incentive. On the other hand, uh, there are parts of the world where millions of people are starving to death. So should, so should the farmers that can, that can do this kind of work and, and make this kind of surplus just say, Hey, this is for me and my neighbors and, uh, the heck with everybody else. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just view that as kind of a, you know, different way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. No, and you ask a, a perfectly relevant question. We have a moral responsibility to feed the world. I'm not saying we as Americans, I'm saying we as humans, the entire human race have a responsibility to feed one yes. another. Um, any responses to that? I know we're up against time, but I wanna, I wanna let this play out because this is good. I don't wanna shut this off. Well, uh, I just want to say in terms of, uh, he, he uses the word harmony. So when he was talking about the relationship between on page 189, land, work, people, and community, mm -hmm. they're all interrelated. They're all connected. And when the needs are being met within that framework, that's harmony. But then when you bring in that tractor and your thousand acres now becomes 2,000 or 5,000 and you have an agribusiness, and then agribusiness creates an abundance of corn or wheat or whatever, so that you must sell it or give it, usually sell it. And then you think about the relationship between the United States and China. And then all of a sudden we put tariffs on some of their products, they put tariffs on our products. And all of a sudden you got to plow under your crop because you can't send it to the markets that you intended. So everything becomes distorted. No longer do you have harmony, but now you have disharmony. And it affects the farmer, it affects the exporters, the people who import, the people that would have depended on those agricultural products in China. Everything becomes a mess. Yeah, but there are still, I mean, I can, I don't know what's going on now, but there are still, I can remember uh, at least a number of years ago, uh, people like the UN distributing food in parts of Africa where people were starving to death, little kids, adults, and uh, I don't know. I, I just can't see us turning away from that kind of uh, situation. Even if, even if the suppliers of that food if their motivation was money, well, that's too bad, but you know. I think I just want to say something just from as someone who lives in Africa most of uh Oh, the <laughs> I was waiting for this. No, I just I just want to add some perspective um, from from what we see over there. And I think it's really interesting because a lot of times we have food coming in, you know, that's produced from other countries and, and is in excess. And then that food is so cheap that the local farmers can't compete with it. So they all go out of business. So I think it, it has to do like what, I think it's Mike down there, or I don't know who, mm -hmm. Mark, but I've had, uh, <laughs> but he was saying, you know, about having harmony and making sure that everything is still in harmony, and not, you know, this disrupting someone somewhere else in the world and thinking about harmony, not just on our local, but also on this really huge scale where what we're doing in the U.S. also impacts agriculture and 
in Africa, it's a lot to think about and it's really overwhelming to figure out what's really is. What's best that, yeah. And I think we also have to think about the history of how Westerners have engaged with Africa. Like, let's not forget, number one, that we exported all their farmers to come do our farming. Number two, um, num number two, we colonized, okay, and abused that land the way we are similarly doing our own land. So we're like, well, you know, it's just a whole bunch of deserts and all that kind of stuff. Well, it didn't used to be that there were, there were decisions that were made in order to extract something from that. Um, and then it was left the way it is, you know, with these scars, like, like Barry describes in Kentucky, he says, our hillsides are scarred, you know, and we see those scars from, from colonialism, you know, still to this day. And so under, so this idea of harmony goes farther back than just what we do right now. We can look back and say, well, wait a second, there were decisions that were out of place for scale, out of place in terms of, um, in terms of harmony, out of place in terms of, of allowing a place to support itself, which Africa was doing just fine before we showed. Uh, Africa is a large continent with many, many cultures, so on and so forth, not as a monolithic um, a monolithic thing, um, we can look back and say, well, gee, yeah, there were decisions that were made that created the situation in which we find ourselves. Um, and, and I think you're speaking to that a little bit too. And we perpetuate that when we undercut those who are trying to make, who are trying to make a go of it with cheap food. Yeah, I but think those, um, he, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, go <laughs> he ahead, says Andy. it, um, the most important, this is on page 193, the most important of those possibilities would be the lengthening of memory. Previous mistakes, failures, and successes would be remembered. The land would not have to pay the cost of a trial and error education for every new owner. Um, and so like, it's, I think this speaks to like a lot of what we've been talking about today, technology, all these things, like there's a can and there's a should, and then there's like a filter. And I think he's advocating that we think more about that filter mm -hmm. um, in terms of do we use the plow? Do we send food somewhere? Like, are we doing the right thing? That's like, I thought for me, that was like the crux of his thought about it. And so any last thoughts? I'll offer mine and then we'll dismiss because like I said, <laughs> we're up against time. Very good. Well, I appreciate this is thick reading and it ended up in some places that I didn't necessarily anticipate, but um, we could, we might have guessed as we think about what it means to be human, as we think about what in the world it means to be a creature of God, to try to understand how we relate to our environment, how we relate to one another, and how all of these things interact with one another towards our own health and towards the health of the ecosystems that we call home. And so I, I, I might encourage you to go back and reread it one more time, having, having processed this a little bit, um, having, and, and to observe the anthropological development, starting from we are terrifyingly ignorant, to towards the back end when he says, you know, some, when he develops our, our knowledge isn't all encompassing, but I think he paints a picture at the end of the day where our knowledge is held not in you and not in me, our knowledge is held in us. And that that is a healthier way of moving forward. It is a, it is a way of remembering the past, a way of transferring, um, transferring knowledge to the future and continuing to pile up knowledge that we might live better in the places that we call home rather than scarring a place and then going to another place, scarring that one, always looking, for the, always looking to exceed our limits, always looking to break out of what it means to be human. Um, and so I might invite you to reread it again with that in mind and also be thinking about, okay, what does this, how might this um, inform how we teach what it means to be a human inside a community of faith? What is it we believe about ourselves and what do those beliefs invite us to consider as we think about how we interact with the places that we call home? Um, and so again, this is, this is worth, um, this is worth spending a little time with, um, and I'm grateful that you've spent the time with it today that you have. And I offer my apologies. I know I'm not the best guide today. Um, I've still got a little too much pigment ore on the mind. I think, um, still got to get some of that out. And as my mind clears up from the ammonia, maybe we'll do a little bit better next week. Um, so what I'm going to do, um, I will post, <laughs> Hey, look, it is what it is. <laughs> so I am going to post the link um, in the Google Drive 
for um for the for the lecture if you want to go back and listen to it um, and just let it let it kind of wash over you another time um, I'll also post the document where we can we can engage in question and conversation if you like my notes will be there as well maybe that'll help you a little bit um, going forward um, so with that I'm going to say thank you to each one of you as always for making time I will see you next Wednesday for our last session um, it does sound like you all are interested in doing one of his fiction works later so we'll look to I'm I'm thinking. Oct late October, early November, we'll kind of gather again. So nothing terribly imminent. I got some things to sort out before I can turn my thoughts really to one of his novels. But we'll look to reconvene then. Um, but next week, we'll be, we'll be here for one more lesson. I'll get that out to you here in the next couple of days. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. 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 Enjoy. Enjoy. Um, see ya.